like to uh, introduce one of our newest writers at the Northern Minor, our sister publication, Colin McClellan. And he had previously worked for Bloomberg, Routers, and Associated Press in Toronto, London, and Johannesburg. So he's, uh, he's been around. And one of his first assignments uh, with our group took him to the Central Newfoundland Gold Rush. But uh, I'd like to introduce to you now uh, Colin McClellan, and he will take it away from there. You are ready to go, Colin? Hey, how are you doing, Robert? Yes, uh, yeah, doing good. Excellent. Good to see you there. I'm going to go off screen and let you take it over. Great. It's great to be here. Like Keith Richards would say, it's great to be anywhere. But uh, we got uh, John McCluskey on tab here. Uh, I guess he's going to pop in. There he is on the video. And I'm just going to give a little background here with bio. Now, John McCluskey has been the president and CEO of Alamos Gold since 2003. He began his career with Glamis Gold Limited. Then in 1996, he founded Grade Resources, where he was CEO until 2003, and he co-founded Alamos with Mining Hall of Famer, Chester Miller. Now, Mr. McCluskey was named Ontario's 2012 Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year, based on a judging panel's assessment of financial performance, vision, leadership, innovation, personal integrity, social responsibility and entrepreneurial spirit. So checking all the boxes there. Today, Alamos is an established intermediate gold producer with three operating mines in North America and a portfolio of development in uh, Mexico, Canada, Turkey, and the US. So good morning, John, how are you doing? Good morning, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, great to see you, great to see you. Um, so there's a bit of the background, and now I kind of want to pivot into the future because what we want to start off talking about is how you're leading innovation at Alamos. So maybe you can take us through what's happening in exploration innovation, development, processing. I'll let you go. Um, you know, with uh, exploration, the developments uh, are are quite extraordinary over the last 15 years or so. And, but I, I would say with, with respect to um, how it's directly affecting Alamos business, probably uh, surface directional drilling has been one of the, the great breakthroughs that has really um, uh, allowed us to rapidly expand reserves and resources at Island Gold. And, um, and the breakthroughs in, uh, in geophysics have, uh, have really helped us on on the regional side of exploration. You know, the, uh, the geologists, if you if you talk to them, they'll they'll tell you that the um, that the way they can tease out the anomalies today from the data is about twenty times more effective. In other words, the the anomalies are are uh, twenty times better resolution than they were with the sophisticated geophysics of you know just a generation ago, and um, that to me is a, it's extraordinary. You know, you still uh, you still have a lot of sleuthing to do, and it, it's just one one tool in the box. But um, it's a much more effective tool than it used to be, and it's led to uh, uh, several discoveries for us. Some down in uh, in the Mulatos district, and uh, two discoveries that we've made in the Lynn Lake district. So uh, it's helping. You know, on the grassroots side, it's really helping. But in terms of uh, you know the near mine exploration uh, that we're doing at, at both Young Davidson and uh, and at uh, Island Gold, we've really benefited from surface directional drilling. It's uh, it allows you to get a lot more data in a, in, a, in a much more cost effective manner. So that that would that that would be what I would say about exploration. In terms of uh, uh, the main thing we wanted to focus on today was uh, was the changes that we made to the Young Davidson mine when we acquired it in 2015. Um, the, the reality was the, the mine was only partially completed when we acquired it in 2015. It was, it was doing roughly 3,800 tons a day from, you know, what, what was really designed as temporary infrastructure, infrastructure at the middle level of the mine. So what it was going to require in order to uh, turn it into a really profitable operation and one that, uh, you know, was set up for the long term. It was going to require a complete development of the of the lower mine, and there was a number of ways we could have approached that. 
Um, I mean, the, the simplest way would have would have been just just to continue to ramp down and uh, and, and do and, and do it all from ramps. So it would have been a fairly expensive way to go. Um, and ultimately, I, I don't think we would have anywhere near as profitable an operation. What we did was go with a fully automated system. Uh, we, we sunk both the, sh the Northgate shaft and the MCM shaft right down to the 1500 meter level. And then we designed a system, of, a fully automated system that would have effectively allow us to mine at a rate of about 8,000 tons a day. And in, in making that, it was a very substantial capital investment. But in making it, not only did we set up that operation to be very profitable for the long run, but we, we, we dramatically reduced the carbon footprint print of the operation. And really, that's one of the, that was one of the key elements of it. Uh, it, it. It makes it a safer environment in which to work. Uh, we, uh, we were able to uh, take out about six trucks by going to a conveyor system. We actually have a, a video that you might show. The whole system is automated. It's run from surface. Uh, you saw that gentleman sitting at a, at a computer system that effectively runs this. Um, or is fed from uh, from it's, it's basically taken out of the scope, fed into the into the circuit through uh, ore chutes that feed directly into crushers that feed onto that five foot wide conveyor system, takes it to the uh, ore or storage bins, then into a fully automated loading pocket where it's skipped to surface. Um, from uh, surface, it's again fed um, fed from the bins into uh, conveyors that take it right into the mill. So after the um, after the miner basically takes the ore out of the stope um, and and puts it into the uh, in, into the uh, ore pass, that's it. There's uh, there's no further handling of the ore, and from that point over, from that point on, we're either using gravity or we're using power that's all generated from the uh, from the Ontario power grid, and that's why we've you know, our, our requirement for ventilation underground is, is drastically reduced because we don't have all those diesel trucks running underground. Uh, and, and that's why the, um, the uh, system is so efficient, uh, both from a, an operating perspective and from a carbon intensity perspective. You're muted, sorry. Sorry, uh, there must be some cost savings there and some emission targets hit at the same time, sort of bang, bang. In, in that, and it, it, indeed, that's what happened. We saw costs come from roughly roughly $1,300 all in sustaining costs. They're down below $1,000 all in sustaining costs now. So that was a, a substantial savings from a, from a per ton perspective. We went from roughly $55 uh, per ton down to $43 per ton, which is where we are now. And, um, and of course, you know, we're still working at it. Great. Do you want to fill in some other automation things that you've done there or? Uh... Well, uh, in it, that, that's already, that's already quite, uh, that, that's the yeah. whole, um, that's the whole flow sheet. If you look at it yeah. from, the, from the face uh, to the mill, the entire flow sheet is, uh, is automated. I guess I could say, you know, in, in, in some respects, it even resembles a circuit because much of the, uh, much of the ore that's processed in the mill is essentially uh, put into the paste backfill system. So we have a paste backfill plant, we add, we add cement, we pump the material back into the, into the mine and, and we fill up the stopes again. So uh, it, it, it resembles a circuit in some respects. We do have a tailings facility and there still is some uh, requirement for tailings, but drastically reduced as a result of the, uh, the pace backfill. Again, that means uh, less haulage and so forth. Uh, it, it's, it's also a much more carbon, uh, a much more efficient way to go as far as carbon intensity. Right, and these innovations are easily transferable to other operations. Other companies might want to consider some of these innovations i'm i'm sure they they are i mean all all underground mines are facing similar challenges and um and and we're all effectively trying to uh, to to uh, address them in different ways I, there's a lot of talk in the industry about using um electronic vehicles underground and and there's 
there's issues with that because uh, if you were to try to run uh, haulage trucks, big haul trucks, uh, 40 ton haul trucks that we use on, 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 a, on, on an electric basis, it, 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 it inevitably, uh, it's a challenge. And right now it doesn't work. The batteries can't really, uh, can't really handle the job. We, we have um, started using uh, electric vehicles for personnel transport. Um, we took that step uh, earlier this year and, and it's uh, so far, uh, it, it, it's, it's looking promising. Um, again, it's, uh, it, it's, it, it's not a, a huge contributor to the, uh, to the carbon footprint. These are, these are smaller vehicles and so forth, but um, it's a start. And uh, I guess I think... there's some uh, innovations coming in the industry in general for the larger vehicles that will eventually be uh, adaptable, eventually be useful in these situations? I, I think so. Uh, but for the time being, we, we address the whole issue by using con a conveyor system that's, it'll run off the power grid and eliminated the trucks that way. We eliminated the trucks altogether. So I, I think that's something that, um, you know, others in the industry are, are going to look at. In fact, just as a point uh, uh, to, to back up what you're saying there, when we completed the um, the uh, the shaft sinking, uh, when we were in the process of completing the shaft sinking. The uh, the mining team from Island Gold, which we now own, but at, at that point they were um, at that point we didn't. They they came up and visited the mine. And they saw what we were doing, and uh, they, they wanted to do something very similar at Island Gold. Of course, the problem was there's a lot of capital involved in doing this, and and the the first step is, in order to justify all that expense is you've got to build out a, a big enough reserve, which they hadn't done at Island Gold. Um, we liked what what they had, and we saw a lot of promise there. Um, and ultimately, we acquired Richmond Mines. But step one, in order to justify doing something similar to what we did at, uh, at Young Davidson, it was to go in and, and, and drill the, the deposit uh, and, and drill it quite aggressively. We, we've invested over 20 million a year since we acquired it in, in 2017 in order to build out the reserves. But once we'd done that, we started down the same road with uh, what we call our phase three. And effectively what we're doing is just what we've done at uh, at uh, Young Davidson, we're we're deepening, we're, we're putting in a shaft, we're putting it down to about fourteen hundred meters to begin with, and uh, effectively we're going to uh, be in a similar situation where we're going to eliminate. Right now, it's a ramp operation, so we're going to eliminate all the haul trucks, and we're going to be operating from a similar sort of automated system. Great, great. I just wanted to clear up maybe a couple of the questions that are coming in through the Q and A chat. Uh, uh, one guest was asking if uh, the flow chart just applies to the one site. And I think uh, you were saying it's primarily Young Davidson, but maybe you have plans for other sites. Indeed, that's the point I was just making that it, it yeah. is, it is it, that's the way we run Young Davidson now. And by the yeah. time we're completed, the uh, phase three of Island Gold, uh, it will be, uh, we'll, we'll take the throughput up from roughly 1,200 tons a day where it is now, we're taking it up to 2,400 tons a day and it'll be operating from a shaft and all that will be tied into the power grid, but similar setup with a shaft and a pace back fill plant. Great, and um, another uh, guest is asking about uh, deeper depths, uh, greater than 500 meters, is the technology transferable down there? Well, Young Davidson, Young Davidson operates down to 1,500 meters right now. And uh, as I said, we're, we're deep, we're, we're putting in a shaft and we're sinking it to roughly 1400 meters to begin with at Island Gold, but you can go much deeper. It's, uh, you know, the, you, you just have a longer skipping time. As long as you've got the, the hoisting capacity, there's, there's no problem with deepening the shaft. We're actually designing our hoists uh, so that we can ultimately uh, take the shaft that we're putting in now at, at Island Gold, we can take it down as deep as 2,000 meters. And another question kind of goes back to exploration asking, uh, is there any technological innovation for oriented core samples? 
Um, not that I'm aware of. I mean, you know, we still do things. The it, it looks like they still do things very much the way they did them when I started in the industry about 37 years ago. Uh, you know, you've got to drill the core, you've got to split the core, and, and then it's all QA, QC. The, the, the worst thing you can do is, uh, you know, go to all that expense of dr dr drilling core and then not get um, not get values back that uh, that are meaningful. And I think there have been problems along those lines uh, uh, over the years in, uh, in in mining exploration. But I, I would say that uh, you know the way things are are set up, um, it's it's pretty old fashioned. You know, you still got to use a drill. Uh, You've still got to split the core. You've, you've still got to sample it. And, and, and you know, good old-fashioned fire assay is still the best way to go. Uh, I, I don't know whether there's anything on the horizon, but uh, for, for the time being, I, I believe everybody's pretty much doing it the way we're doing it. Right. I hear a lot of uh, talk about uh, lab laboratory backups, you know, just not enough staff or, you know, time to get all the testing done. Maybe there needs to be some innovation there. I don't know. Maybe you, you have a perspective on that. I, I, I think that that's a function of the boom and bust uh, cyclical nature of our industry. I mean, sometimes the, 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 I can recall many times throughout my career where the, the labs are, are uh, cutting back and, and, and they're just not getting any business at all. And they're grateful for whatever core you can ship to them. And, uh, and then you get times like now where there's, a huge amount of exploration. It's just not gold mining. You know, we're, we're gold miners, but uh, you know there, there's all kinds of mineral exploration going on right now. Uh, there's a huge hunt for for the so-called battery metals. You know, people are looking for nickel, copper, you name it, and uh, and that's keeping the labs really busy. And that's primarily why I think you get uh, you get these backlogs. So there, there just isn't enough capacity. Uh, and then the cycle will turn. And uh, people will stop drilling as they usually do, and then they'll be over capacity for a while. Right. And I think we're just, that's the way it's always been, and I think that's going to continue. Right. Another com uh, question coming in. I'll just read it. It's a couple sentences. A lot of mining companies seem to have embraced ESG, setting themselves ambitious ESG target over the past few years. But challenges still lie in how to move from intent to action, what is Alamo doing to overcome that challenge? Um, I think, you know, you've talked a lot about it, I guess, in, in, in some of the areas. Is there anything else you want to add? Well, I think you, you have to start making your decisions. Um, you know, it really starts from square one. Where are you going to operate as a mining company? And, you know, there's, there's certain countries where their idea of, of what they consider to be a safe mine, I, I would say that doesn't conform with, with our values. There's certain places where um, things like human rights, where uh, fair, fair wages, and so where those don't really conform with our values. So I think avoiding those kind of places right off the bat, that, 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 that really helps you on the on the social side of ESG, which I don't think is anywhere near talked talked about enough in our industry, we we're, we're often uh, be, be just because of what goes on in, in media, social media, and that kind of thing. The emphasis is is typically on the environment, but the the social side of this uh, really matters as well. And frankly, Canada is one of the best place places to operate in the world, and uh, and you know, eighty five percent of our our net asset value is from our our two Canadian operations. And uh, I, I would say that uh, uh, from, a, from an environmental perspective, Ontario's and, and places like Ontario and Quebec, they have to be the best places in the world to operate because primarily these, these in industries uh, in, in these provinces run off of hydroelectric power. So you build an operation, you tie into the power grid and you're getting the benefit of uh, this low, low carbon intensity approach. And, uh, and, and so you've got to make that first big decision, you know, I, you know to try to compete in, in places like Ontario and Quebec is very tough to get hold of good quality assets here. It's very difficult for smaller companies. Uh, you know, of the 10 uh, most important gold mines in Canada, two of them are owned by Alamos Gold, and those are the only two assets practically not owned by a major. So, 
you know, that's how competitive it is. You, you, you've got to go up against the major mining companies if you want to be operating anything meaningful in Canada. Uh, and, and, I, and I guess this competition bleeds over into the social aspect of ESG and automation. There's decisions to be made, trade-offs maybe, uh, automation helps with competitiveness, uh, and you have to be concerned about the, the maybe the community as well. Hiring well, and... Uh, the, Labor absolutely demand. absolutely key i mean you know most of the the mines that operate in canada people that live in those lo local communities a lot of them work at the mines that it's often the backbone of the community and uh, and that's why you know you 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 can't ignore the, the needs of, of those communities where we, we see ourselves as a an integral part not just of, of the economy but of every aspect of, of those communities and and we, we take that quite seriously. Um, and that goes for having our head office in Toronto as well. I mean, we, we feel it's important to make, make a positive impact uh, by just by the fact that we're, we're based here in Toronto and, and, and di different initiatives we get involved with here, particularly in regard to the United Way where, uh, you know, we've, we've tried to make a serious impact uh, as an organization uh, through our involvement with the United Way. But, you know, the social side of, of, of the equation, um, you know, everybody's talking about the environmental side of the equation, and there's this big rush to reduce carbon footprint. It's, a, it's, it's important, and, and we take it seriously. And, but for us, it was, it was just so um, serendipitous that the very things that we needed to do in order to create really e efficient operations were also the same things that were required to reduce the carbon footprint. So by undertaking these initiatives, we achieved both. And the key to it all really was capital. And this, this, is, this is one of the, the, the main hurdles that uh, development companies especially are going to face. The capital cost of building a mine in Canada right now is extraordinarily high. You know, even, even the expansion that we're doing at uh, at Island Gold, that, that's a billion Canadian dollars between now and, and 2026. It's, it's roughly 750 US, so call it a billion Canadian dollars. That's a massive investment. And that's, that's a mine that's already operating. And thank goodness that it, it generates enough free cash flow. It, it generates enough cash flow that it will mostly pay for its own expansion. But uh, this, kind of, this is the kind of upfront investment that ultimately will be required in order to build the, the, the most efficient and the most carbon friendly operations. Well, we're almost near time and I wanted to squeeze in one kind of fun question. Are you a fan of Quentin Tarantino, the 14 fifths of McCluskey? Yeah. I, <laughs> this I, is I, the movie that's hidden within his latest movie, Once Upon well, a Time in Hollywood. I. I saw that movie. I thought it was a brilliant movie. I, I am quite a fan of uh, Quentin Tarantino. And as you know, what he, what he often does in his movies is he makes references to other movies. And uh, that one happens to be a reference to the, uh, the Godfather movie where, if you remember the, the, the crooked police captain who uh, socks uh, Al Pacino in the face. That, that was right, Sterling point. Hayden. Play yeah, that, that, that was his homage yeah. to the Godfather. Yeah, yeah, because his name was McCluskey. Yeah, it's it's quite yeah. something. Yeah, yeah, you don't hear the name very often uh, in, in the movies, uh, but but there you go. Yeah, well, and the character within Tarantino's McCluskey is a Nazi hunting uh, flamethrower guy, you know, going yeah. after the bad guys, and uh, maybe that's uh, what you're on about your aggressive attack on automation, innovation, ESG. So. Uh, a way to wrap it up there with some parallels. And uh, I think, uh, am I ready to throw it back to Robert? Are you ready? Yeah, I think we are. We're right on schedule. And I really want to thank you very much, John. That was a very informative uh, discussion, uh, the kind of information we were hoping you would share about uh, what you're doing at your current site and what it also takes to build the, you know, the carbon neutral mind of the future. Um, I did have one quick question before you did go. I was just wondering with all the new technology we have now, does it make smaller deposits more economically feasible going forward as we 
search for all the, like you say, we need more minerals than we actually know we need. And a lot of times we always just go the bigger, the better for the mine. But um, is this something that could happen? Well, what I've, um, what I've found in our experience is the economies of scale are, are extremely uh, helpful. And uh, it, it, it's always going to be difficult to um, create a, a, a very small profitable mine. I think they're always going to be more challenging. Uh, there's no question that uh, Island Gold operating at 2,400 tons a day is going to be a, a much more profitable operation and a, a much better operation than it than it is today at 1,200 tons a day. Uh, similar to Young Davidson, you know, we, we've we've more than doubled its capacity since we acquired it in 2015, and it's it's a much better operation for it. And and unless the operations, unless all these operations are profitable how are we going to afford to invest in innovation? Yeah. So I, 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 I definitely um, see opportunities uh, for, um, especially for smaller companies to, to develop uh, smaller operations. I think there's a place for them. I just know that they're going to be challenging because you'd be surprised that, uh, that the capital cost for even building something small is quite high and then when you start looking at payback uh it's very hard to generate um, a reasonable payback with a small operation unless of course it's say very high grade yeah okay no thank you i just thought yeah with some of the new technology that you can get you know just get get the, the ore from the rock a little quicker but i i still see it is going to come down to the economy of scale and uh, yeah. great okay thank breaking you breaking rock is breaking yeah. rock is not cheap <laughs> Great. Thank you very, very much, John. And uh, if you have any follow-up questions, we will send them along to you and hopefully you'll, you'll take some time to answer them. Just uh, to It'd keep be my pleasure. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks again. Nice to be with you today. Bye-bye.